The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everybody. It's Kevin Humanick. Thank you for attending this month's um, webinar for Sustainable Labs Canada. Today, we have Murray Guy um, from Shift to Lean to give a presentation on how lean principles can deliver high-performance labs. So I'll introduce Murray uh, just in a moment. Just want to make sure that uh, attendees understand that during uh, Murray's presentation, we'd be happy to take questions, which I'll relay to Murray at the end of his presentation, and he can respond. Um, the question dialog box is in your control panel for the webinar, so please, as Murray's presenting, please feel free to submit your questions in writing, and I'll relay those to Murray for his response at the end of his presentation. Just one more thing I wanted to mention is to please uh, be sure to uh, register for this year's conference coming up in Toronto at the Beanfield Centre in Toronto uh, from the 18th to the 20th of November. Registrations open and uh, the early bird registration pricing is still in effect until the end of this month. So we encourage everybody that's on the line to make sure that you're registered for the conference and we're looking forward to seeing you all there. So Murray is here to present, as I mentioned. Um, just want to introduce Murray. Murray specializes in the implementation of lean and integrated practices to deliver cost-effective high-performance projects. Utilizing lean project delivery, he's been able to demonstrate that Living Building Challenge, Net Zero, and Lead Gold projects can be delivered at no additional cost. As an early practitioner in establishing the lean and green building industries, Murray has gained the depth of experience needed to challenge teams to collaborate, integrate, and eliminate waste in the pursuit of cost-effective, sustainable building solutions. As a target value delivery and lean commissioning specialist, Murray can provide training or join your team as a facilitator to develop fully functional integrated designs at less cost. As a member of LCI Canada, Murray has been instrumental in rolling out the LCI-C certification program. Murray has developed and delivered lean fundamentals, last planner system, and target value delivery workshops, created a guide for lean fundamentals and target value design, implemented LPS and TVD processes on several projects, and provided on-site coaching for implementing LPS. So Murray, thank you for, uh, for offering to give this presentation. And without further ado, please take it away. OK, thanks, Kevin. Good morning, everybody. Um, yeah, and I think it's kind of an appropriate topic, high performance labs, when you, we look at the leaders debate about um, climate change and climate action. And uh, so, you know, I, I think from what I'm hearing that it, it's a number one or two issue and that there should be funding for, you know, getting labs up to a, a less energy use so we can we can do our point. So um, um, I took the liberty of uh, changing the, the title of the slide to make the jump to lean project delivery for lab projects as a just a, an action for you. Um, and hopefully today we'll go through the business case for lean to deliver high performance labs and you'll want to make that jump. So um, it's all about the team, the systems we use, collaborating to deliver wall projects. So I, I went to work at Innovation Place Research Park in uh, 1997 after I graduated from, uh, well, I actually took engineering in Thunder Bay, worked in the controls industry for 10 years, and then along the way went to work for Innovation Place after I did an MBA. And uh, the first day I dug tested was my boss, the guy on the right, and he, I said, what's, what's my job description? I was hired as a project manager. And he says, make me money not build me green buildings. And so I had to learn how to uh, use integrated design to achieve higher performance for no additional cost. So on our sixth project, um, third lead, or the first lead goal project targeted in, in Saskatchewan, um, we, we ended up with uh, some problems after I promised Doug that we could do lead gold at no additional capital cost. So drum roll, please. You know, we open up the, the tender documents or, or the, the bids for the general contractors using a 
a, a traditional design tender bid process for this um, lab project, $7.5 million lab project, or it was actually more, not a lab project. It was a innovation place. It accommodates labs with all, in all of their buildings, but it was uh, more, I'd say this one was more of an office building. But we were $9.7 million on a $7.5 million budget. I had a $750,000 contingency. And, you know, I was getting ready to go to Australia, take my family away for the summer, and all of a sudden we're way over budget. Talk about stress, you know? Um, so PCL had just finished a, a project for us in, at, in Saskatoon, the uh, 421 Downey Road project, where we got, a, 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 that was a lab project with the greenhouses and everything, and, and we delivered it. And so we ex we were very confident that our seven point five million dollar number was a good number. So the team ended up getting together, all the sub trades in a room, and then within you know one week we figured found out that the structure was we'd used a wood structure with a large grid, and it was way out of whack. And we we fought, found one point six million dollars in savings. I had to contribute seven hundred six hundred thousand dollars of the contingency to close the gap. And we ended so we were only left with $150,000 contingency to deliver this, this project that the team had, had redesigned, put in a concrete structure instead of wood. And so um, I, I looked at these guys and say, I got no more money left. Uh, are we going to be able to do this? That's a very small contingency for an a eight or nine million dollar project. And we did it. And so that's when I, I, I came to the conclusion I would never do another project using traditional ways of doing business and i didn't even know about integrated project delivery or lean project delivery but just understood it as being a team-based approach so we look at what what do owners value project schedule cost control quality safety and what do we deliver um the old way project 70 percent over budget 70 70% of uh, projects delivered late, there's lack of trust, working in silos, sometimes we need lawyers, poor quality, and the, our industry in North America wastes $120 billion per year. Why, why don't we turn that all into net zero buildings at no additional capital costs? I don't know why. So the, these are all studies of the industry done, completed by Lean Construction Institute. What is the most important factor for better project performance? By far, it's assembling a team. And so why then do we, if, we, if team is so important, why do we insist on selecting teams based upon tendering and, and getting the low price guys in a room and expect them to perform? So we need to take a leap of faith and make the jump, which is why I made the change in the name of this presentation. We need to make the jump, and hopefully today we will go through enough case studies that you'll want to make that jump to doing a collaborative team-based approach to delivering your project, where we optimize the whole, continuous improvement, focus on flow, eliminate waste, and have way more successful projects. I'm just gonna and it's all about creating value for the owner. So the team needs to work in a spirit of trust and collaboration while collaborating to create value. And when we say team, there we mean designers. We need all the contractors, and we'll go through examples. We'll talk about the Richardson College for the Environment, why that was key to, to fixing that broken budget. And we need the building owners totally engaged in, in defining what value is and making decisions about what represents the best value. And we work in a spirit of trust and collaboration to deliver value. So the biggest barrier for most people out there is that we think that there's a procurement barrier, that um, by selecting a team based on qualifications and maybe what their profit margins needs to be isn't a competitive tendering process. Well, at the my for my first project, we had an Excel spreadsheet. We we interviewed the mechanical, electrical, controls, um, envelope people because we we needed to fix a budget. 
and and we rated them on their ability to collaborate, innovate, and we needed to. We didn't have any pricing because we didn't have the job designed yet, and we ended up um, having a design assist fee. So if we didn't like the the single envelope that we got from the mechanical contractor or the one of the suppliers, we we would, we were free to go tender. So there was a, there's no risk, and it is a competitive process. So. Um, is there a business case to, to take the leap, make the jump? Well, if we look at manufacturing and a lot of the, the lean construction systems and processes came out of the manufacturing industry, where they convert 62% of the effort into value, the, green, the big green piece of the pie. And in construction, we're at a pathetic 10%. So we're, we're going to look at uh, some stats from the Moose Jaw Hospital project a little bit later, and we'll see how big we can make that construction pie when we have a really good team. So Toyota figured this out. How much more profitable are they? I usually have asked this question in a room and everybody takes guesses. Um, Toyota makes $2,200 per car on average, and their next closest competitor and I think it might be Ford. It, I think it's about $960 per car. So how much more profitable? Toyota's two times more profitable. And we've we've seen that from the their success in the industry. You know, they're developing hydrogen cars and the, the hybrid cars. So they're 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 ahead of the game. And and they have exceptional quality. So why is our industry broken? We got to understand why it's broken before we can fix it. Two main reasons bad behavior when you get everybody working on and on lowest cost and we're inefficient at, at the at the way we plan and deliver our work so two main reasons so what can we do to fix those so th th these two characters at the bottom on right up your screen greg powell and glenn ballard in 2002 asked that same question how are we going to fix this inefficiency one a contractor one uh, a phd university dude and so they ended up taking all a lot of the lessons learned through manufacturing and basically came up with a system that to apply the same principles and practices to construction and started the construction institute in the states and that picture at the bottom i went to six of these conferences in the states before we got Lean construction institute canada going and those are a lot of the gurus up there talking about how how lean works and how we can deliver way better projects. So uh, we can fix the bad behavior by building a team. And we have to have a different expectation for how we operate. Um, uh, traditionally, we blame, we work in silos, we, we have some people with bad attitudes because we never selected them. We selected them on price or not how well they work as a team. Uh, we have promises that we don't deliver, bad designs and excuses. Well, we need we need to sign up a team, and we we talk about all the stuff in the interview. Is that we need to collaborate? We've got to focus on the right work at the right time. We need to listen to the client about what represents value and not what we think is value. And we've got we've got to make sure there's no constraints to getting the work flowing. And we need an engaged team, and we've got to deliver on our promises. Simple as that. When do we get ever get up away with saying, "Oh, we'll do that for you next week"? And and not deliver that promise, and then the next person can't keep doing their work. So, how, how we normally kick off the, a project is that we, we, that's a different way of working together. So, maybe we better go to and have a boot camp at the start of a project to get everybody on the same page. And at boot camp, it's kind of like Karate Kid, where you're, you're doing all these silly games and workshops and stuff like that, and you're wondering, what am I I'm learning? And I just love that story about Karate Kid. Daniel Son, you know, come here. And he all of a sudden, Daniel Son knows how to be the Karate Kid. And he, because he'd been waxing the floor and he'd been painting the fence and he, all these things, principles and practices just became second nature to him. And he, he actually had practiced the right things to be successful at delivering his project, which was to win a tournament. And so we need to learn to see and minimize the eight wastes. We need to keep the site clean, which a byproduct of that is, is better safety. We've got to minimize the variation in capacity. 
What happens if we got one person doing five units of work and he passes that on to two people that can only do one unit of work and th four units of work sit there as work in progress? So, you know, we got to get the right work flowing so that the next team can process it and there's no um, inventory sitting around. We got to plan for small batches of work. We think big batches are better. Well, the boot camp shows you that small batch or single piece flow work is, is better. And we, we need to have the, the customer, like Toyota, always didn't just ship a bunch of cars over here. When the sale went in for the red Toyota Corolla, the order, the, it pulled the work from the factory to deliver the right car of the right color. And we, then we don't have to have these big yards full of, of cars that cost a lot of money and eat away at our profit. So we got to pull that work. So at Bootcamp, we also learn a framework for how we apply all of these principles and practices to how we are going to deliver our project. You've got to set clear targets by working with the owner to define what success looks like and value. We've got to design to those targets. You know, is the budget matching the your your what you need and what you want and what what represents value? And we've got to build to targets and on time. And then I've, I've just added, because we're in, a, this is, applies to all projects, but specifically lab projects. Um, I, I was forced into inventing a, a Lean CX um, system for, which drove the Okanagan College project and the CSRB project. And so I, I've added the test to the targets, and that's the Lean commissioning pro system that we'll talk about later last planner system how we can use that system to manage schedule target value delivery how we can or target value design is another name used for it we, how we can design to deliver high performance at 18 percent less cost and we've got to get everybody in a big room and make sure that the, the team is healthy so that that's our framework for delivering a successful lab project we, we start to practice with the systems. So that's actually the uh, a one day workshop using the Vallejo system to learn how to pull plan our work and deliver projects more efficiently. So let's, let's talk about target value delivery. You know, an important aspect of this, and I, I'm, I actually, the, the word owner's project requirements comes out of the commissioning world. Under, under ASHRAE guideline zero is it's the commissioning guy's responsibility to make sure that there's a clearly defined target for the owner that the owner so that when we go to do design commissioning that we we understand that the, what the systems what the performance needs to be so we can commission the design to make sure that the design team has met the owner's project requirements. So same thing in target cost design. We need to know that the project team can deliver a fully functional system to meet the target cost. And we're, we're gonna learn that by putting a team in a, a good team in a room, we can do that at 18% less cost. We, take, we, have, we can have systems, we can improve the functionality or we can um, decrease the cost by making them maybe having well, why do we need 50% extra capacity? Let's go with 30, as long as the owner's okay with that. He knows that he can't add so many more fume, fume hoods. And uh, maybe we can increase the functionality or, or re save some energy. So we go through each system and we decide whether it's worth spending more money on that system or less money. But in the end, we need to have all of the systems and the trade-offs between all of the systems come up to a cost and in most cases because we have people in the team and we're able to work out the risk of everybody having to carry their own contingency um, that we we're, we're able to deliver higher value at less cost and fully functional so this these stats here are not uh, fake news they're uh, tvd research um, the main principles of target costing is make cost and value have cost and value drive the design process instead of calculating the cost after the design is complete. So it's very proactive. We we des design to a cost and we tr do trade-offs on value as opposed to guessing what that is 
guessing at what the cost is going to be after the design. Just makes sense to me. It has been shown that the systematic application of target value design leads to improved performance, 19% less than what a design tender bid project would be. That's a huge number. So it, it, let's put that in perspective. With 19% less cost, we shouldn't even have to have the discussions that we are about how we're going to fix climate change. It doesn't cost 19% to, to deliver a net zero building, which we'll talk about a little bit later. And so all buildings can be net zero at no additional capital cost, just using this system to, in the design process. The part that I liked about Richardson College for the Environment is we delivered that project with 2% contingency because we had no more money. So most project contingencies average 7.9%. So owners love not having to carry a large contingency. So we also need a system to um, deliver the project like on, on the Richardson College for the Environment project, we needed to deliver the project for a September start. We're $10 million over budget and we had two years to build. So we need a system to manage the schedule. And so we're going to talk, it's you set your milestones, you break out a whole bunch of phases, you get everybody in a room and you, you pull plan the work. This is what you, and we do this in boot camp, and you come up with a, a plan that everybody has helped develop from the bottom up. And we then we break that down into weekly work plans and we track on a weekly, daily basis that we actually deliver what we said we were going to do. And when we do that, we can get projects done six months early. This is what it looks like. Um, uh, we get all the trades, the architectural guys, the structural, mechanical, electrical, we get every, everybody in a room and with all of their tasks and, and how long it takes to do this task and, and how many men I'm going to need. And you're put by putting this sticky on the board, you're going to commit that this is the work I'm going to do this week with this many men. And my prerequisite for that work is that I need um, this, this preliminary sections work done by the designer or else I can't do my work. And so you pull all the work from the people previous and you get everybody reorganizing and, and committing to the work and you get things done early. Um, we take the a phase plan, which is normally uh, 13 weeks and, and in, in our construction big room trailer we'll have a, some rolling six rolling boards which we call the six week work plan or the six week look ahead and it, it, we break it down into what we're going to do with what trade on what week and week one and two are more granular in that we know in the morning and the afternoon on tuesday these trades are in these this zone doing this work and that's how granular you need to get in order to make sure that we are going to deliver on time and there's no surprises. Simple as that. So it's this lean commissioning that you're talking about. Holy smokes, we're moving along on time. So I'm going to have to start ripping a little bit because I've got a lot of key studies I've got to talk about. So lean commissioning is a way where we um, integrate commissioning from the start. We, we end up making sure that the systems will work so we don't end up with a bunch of change notices and having to do contingency. We, we set functional tests to test for performance and we plan for getting the work done early and so that we're not um, chasing, sitting there with buildings that don't perform for eight months normally after the project's done or sometimes longer. So we need a commitment to get the C CX work done early and we we use the the milestones as giving the getting the mechanical electrical and control systems all up and running. Lean CX is, uh, we resolve, just as a summary, design CX resolves system design and interface issues. Lean CX is an extreme coordination in getting the right work done by working, taking a systems approach. And when we do this right, we have a happy team at the end. So all this work happens in a big room. And uh, so the big room is a system because we have all these people working hard to deliver the project we need to make sure that they're healthy and so and not just and functional so it's important a big room to understand 
Why, what are the dysfunctions of a team? The absence of trust, fear of conflict, lack of commitment, avoidance of accountability, and attention to results. Ah, five dysfunctions of the team. If we just look at what we've been talking about, how a lean project operates, they address all of these things. The other thing that it, uh, lean projects address is, if any of you have read this book, it was, um, it's, it's one of my top shelf books. What is the single biggest factor that motivates a team? So some of you might say money or getting Fridays off. Well, you know, it, it was very interesting to see the reality, and I know this for a fact, is that the number one motivating factor for most people is having a good day, getting to work, get something accomplished in a day. So Lean Project Delivery is about a planning to be it, it, removing constraints and preparing the handoffs so that people can get go to work and and get work done the most motivating factor for everybody and so why would you ever want to work on any other kind of a job site so it, the big room is where we th this is actually a survey that we we results that we um put up or was on the kinetics project in victoria where we surveyed, you survey on a monthly basis and see how feel, people are feeling about whether we're hitting the target, whether we're making money, whether we're minimizing risk, while we're, is there, do we have good behavior or are people pointing fingers? Are we a safe site? Are we finding innovative solutions? So we, we measure that health. And the, when we use a spider graph like this, the ones that are heading to the outside are strong. We have good customer value in this case, but our teamwork is only um, two thirds of the way. So we're three out of five on teamwork. So maybe this month we need to work on teamwork. Relationships seem okay, but the team's not working. Maybe we're in too much in silos. And so you use this cert monthly survey to adjust your collaboration or your you might need more training or something to make sure that the team is healthy because healthy teams win championships. So main project delivery works. Improve safety, greater customer satisfaction, higher quality, reduced project schedule, greater productivity, all the things that owners care about. So but let's jump into a case study now. Sherman, Sherman Kreiner, U of W, we were commissioning the Manitoba Hydro lead platinum building across the street. I walked across the street to U of W and to see if they needed commissioning for the development that was going on on Portage there. And uh, I had approached them to do commissioning, but I didn't know that they were $10 million over budget and they needed some help in, um, you know, we were delivering lead gold projects at no additional capital cost. And they were sitting there with a project that was $10 million over budget with a lead silver target. So I brought them on a, a tour of innovation place facilities and uh, they basically, I'd, I'd been through a tough project and they convinced me to come to work for them as their, their owner's project rep. And so how did we, how did we fix this project? I'm just going to go through and, um, so um, the, the project was designed to be green because um, Lloyd Axworthy had committed to their, all their buildings not using any more energy. And uh, we were $10 million over budget. We had three programs going into a lab building, 70% labs. And, uh, so, and it still needed to be a signature building, so we couldn't build it out of metal. It needed to be a great looking building. So we started, you know, first thing, get the team together, um, got to know the auditors really well. And, and Sherman was able, took that book, Broken Buildings, Busted Budgets, and was able to convince the, the board to, that we needed to bring the whole team on board and get to work. So, we came up with some really because you guys are lab folks. I'm going to I'm, I'm going to talk about the specific systems and how we fix that because it's hugely should be of interest to you. First thing is we had 14 foot high ceilings in a lab building that had 70% um, labs in it. What happens? How many air changes you need? 
to move through those labs drove a huge mechanical system that we couldn't afford to build. So we, and, and the reason they were 14 foot high was to bounce light into the uh, inside of the lab. You quickly find from the energy models that reducing the building skin and the volume um, is going to way save more way more energy than the, the providing uh, good daylighting. And so we earthquake the building down. And um, I've been working at, at Innovation Place on some utility labs, and 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 we have to ask ourselves. When is a lab a lab? Um, maybe in the green mode, full fume hoods are on, let's um, full aid air changes or whatever it takes to, to maintain good air quality and safety in a lab. We've got codes to meet. What about if we're in the yellow mode and all of the and we can get um, all the protocols of having your chemicals put away because it's a teaching lab right now when we've got PowerPoint presentation on the board. So we can have a, 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 a three air change or a four air change utility lab mode where the chemicals are all put away. Or how about if we it always put our chemicals away every night and we're able to shut that lab down to 0.5 air changes. So when you take into consideration not moving eight air changes, and, and three air changes, a lot less than eight, eight air changes. We already reduced the, the, the amount of air changes by the ceiling height, and then we shut our systems down at night. Well, that just knocked the hell out of that labs or that mechanical room system. And then we use ventilated benches. You guys are, um, that this was, a, I didn't even know about them um, before I came to this project. They were fairly new on the market, and you, you, have more functional use of space. And so I think we use probably about 50% ventilated benches. They use less air than a fume hood and they're actually treat the airflow better. So you, and you guys could probably challenge me on that, but that's, we went that way and it worked. So then another, so we, we've got less airflow, safer ways to work in these labs. So then how about, if we could come up with some technology to recover, we've already knocked the airflow way down and we come up with this technology to recover the heat off of the energy that is safe. And so who would ever have funk that we could have uh, bring labs through a, a heat recovery wheel? Well, it just so happens that there's a, a and recover the enthalpy, the, the moisture off of it. Well, that Semco had a, a, a wheel and it has a purge section in it that less than one one hundredth of a percent of cross contamination. By the time you dilute that with all of the fresh outside air that we bring in, there was no way we were even coming close to any limits that, of, of safety within that lab. And so um, there's an angstrom sieve on this wheel. It's just great technology. And so we had to actually, actually had to take our team and the lab managers down to meet the guys that had the, the patents and then to design this system to see how it was controlled. We already were going to do full commissioning, so we had confidence that we were going to test and make sure that this worked properly. So you can see now that by doing all those things, our mechanical, the heating system, the cooling system, everything. Oh, and, and, and another big part of the, the discussion was, uh, how much spare capacity do we we don't have any more money so that you know designers will add a spare nobody ever got fired for making something too big well we challenged that we made it we right sized the, the systems with the operations people knowing how tight the design was and and we, we were able to come up with a you know maybe 20 percent spare capacity instead of 40 percent so there's our our red light yellow light green light system that every lab had indication about what mode we were in um, we picked really good quality um, airflow or, or uh, manufacturer of uh, our air handling equipment um, we actually had to um, sign off that there there was shared risk and reward i'll call this this semco heat recovery wheel that we we the science steering committee are going to buy into this technology and 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 give the designer 
our, our uh, a vote of confidence that we are we're, we're going to go this way so um how did we how did lean help fix this project and deliver a huge my i think this is my favorite project of all time happened to be in in winnipeg where a lot of you are from we earthquake the building we oh we also pulled in the building foundations on portage to save some uh, shoring costs we we reduced the amount of brick in around the back. It still needed to be a segment. We reduced reduced glazing in the offices with the the shrinking of, or the ceiling heights. Um, and this we had a, a greenhouse on our roof, so it's a very complicated. We had a vivarium in this project, and we delivered it for I think three hundred and twenty bucks a square foot. So amazing accomplishment with a great team. And so I, I don't have time to go through reiterate all what I've just said. So. Um, Here's just some A3s. The A3 is how we make the business case for using metal insulated panels. We had to do our studies and get the team in the room. We had dynamic costing with the people doing the work and go through. And th this is our target value delivery process. And what we ended up in with was what we think is one of uh, North America's most energy efficient labs at 59 point something percent less than the model national energy code we hit we got lead gold and our target was only silver we we brought it in with less than a two percent contingency a wonderful project i ended up working on six projects for the u of w because of this project so and uh there's a, just a testimonial that lean project delivery works make the jump so took those lessons learned to um uh, another project, which was a SRC analytical lab. How are we doing, Kevin? How are we doing for time? Ten. Yeah, seven. we're about 37 minutes in there, Murray. So you got about okay. 23 minutes left in total. <laughs> okay. Okay, thanks. Yep. Oh. Um, here, here's another case study, having just delivered a, a very efficient lab. Um, we competed, this was an energy an energy retrofit project that we were interviewed for and we we convinced them that lean project delivery was the only way to, that you're going to deliver this project and that maybe we might need to question whether energy is really the right thing that we should be focusing everything on you know you've done the audit we, we figured well let, why don't we fix save enough energy and fix this facility and uh, in order to do that, we, we the first thing that we did was find out that everything was so disjointed. And this lab had been created over six different iterations. And so we suggested that maybe the best thing you need to do is focusing on the people and the space as opposed to saving the smaller energy dollars. And so we ended up doing a, a study that um, a, a flow analysis of how people worked in the space. And th this is what the analysis looked like. And we, and we found out that there was workflow issues in all of the yellow spaces there. So we ended up designing a, a better workflow that basically had a, a, a $6 million net present value for the owner, which is a really good investment. And we got to renew their buildings for them and, and, and save a, way more energy because we got, le got by with um, a lot less fume hoods and they they were using all of this jointed like that but unfortunately the project got cancelled so i can't give you positive results from that project other than it, it was a really good experience till we hit that one so then moving on to okanagan college um gary McEwen, um it, 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 i got to know him because my our wives were lab techs together and uh he he came to saskatoon and over a glass of wine he, he said murray i I had, we delivered this net zero living building challenge um, project in Penticton, and I lost all my profit uh, commissioning the job to try to get to net zero. Can you, I, I know you understand commissioning and about net zero buildings. Can you help me out? So um, he, he ended up uh, all this half dead zombie controls at the Penticton pro project ate up his profit. So. He introduced me to the owner, Kathleen Lossman, who's now a, we're partners in Shift to Lean. Kathleen, we need to handpick the team, adopt target value des design and the last planner system, and we need to invent this lean commissioning system. 
And so if you're willing to take, make the jump, take the leap of faith, we can get this done. So we, we created a new milestone, done is done, that we're gonna, there's not gonna be eight months of losing your profit PCL. And uh, let, we, we actually presented this commissioning system at the National Lean Conference in Boston and, and uh, we're San Francisco, I think, to, to Lean Construction Institute in the States. And so this system was basically set up to, uh, um, we use the functional tests to pull the mechanical and electrical and controls work to get the project done. And that we had to have the project, it, it actually backed up the project so that the, the, the building needed to be completed two months early. And so lean commissioning actually drove the, con, the construction process. So um, th this was the first project that we ever had a, a boot camp and it, we just found it as the best way to ramp people up on mean principles and practices. That's what a boot camp looks like. Um, it was interesting that uh, the construction, once you start pull planning all of the work using the last planner system, the amount of plans and detailed work structures and all of the design information, why do you need a, a, a big room? Well, there's lots of visuals as you can imagine. And so we ended up having to get a double wide trailer on site. And that was one of the first things that we, we did. This project was so successful that we, um, the Okanagan team were the catalyst for getting Main Construction Institute Canada up and running. And Kathleen was the co-chair of LCI Canada for a number of years. I was on the board. Okay, let's move on to another lab project, a CSRV project that was just completed about a year ago. Murray, we need occupancy in two years. We need a different system. Well, rate construction in the University of Saskatchewan. Uh, um, if you want us to get this thing commissioned, it, to meet your funding requirements, we need to adopt lean commissioning, which really means that you need to send the whole team to boot camp. And uh, that's what, here's the lean commissioning driving, in, implementing the last planner system into the project done is done is a, the milestone and we need it to be done for the funding dollars what went wrong we always learn so we pull planned everything we delivered the systems but unless you implement the pull planning and the weekly work plans down to what's happening in the controls guys computer they you could have one team member fail and it, it drags the whole team down. So I, I learned the lesson learned is that we pull plan the whole commissioning system, but we did not break out the controls people's work to the level that we needed to. And so we ended up becoming involved in a, as the commissioning coordinators to make sure that on a daily, weekly basis that the right work, the little black box called controls was put up onto the six week look ahead and that we got this work done. So uh, last planner system is a great system. Lesson learned, it needs to be implemented 100% by on all trades. Need to hold every trade accountable on a weekly basis, no exceptions. Okay, if I still have time, I can talk about this project. I'm just looking at the time, 1044. Uh, I'll go quickly. Um, living building challenge, net zero, no additional capital cost. A wonderful project. Um, it was delivered using integrated project delivery where the contracts are set up with shared risk and reward. Um, just imagine this, this project was lean from the get-go. The owner of the project, Dennis Cuckoo, um, is quite a character, believes, believed and it was proven that we can deliver net zero buildings at no additional capital cost. An interesting experiment that we ran, it, it, this is his staff, is um and you might be interested in this is that um depending on how people dress and and we always with ashray design to 22.8 degrees well do we really need to have such a tight range and design parameters when at innovation place with a retro commissioning program pro project we found that we could save um four percent energy by one degree change in in set point and we came up with 
so it, the bottom line is that um, it, it, existing comfort standards are more stringent than, than are economically viable and that we can have nine degrees plus or minus seven degrees, te, um, 10, um, 10 to 30 percent energy savings without affecting comfort. That's huge. So um, keep that in mind next time you're designing your systems because to hit a, a, tw a high, a low temperature in the summer can drive a significant capital cost in cooling systems. Conclusion, staff working in an office environment would not likely experience productivity decline or level of comfort satisfaction for temperature ranges 20 to 26 degrees Celsius. Okay, I could go into the Moose Jaw Hospital project, but I think I would like to keep time for questions. So I'm just gonna quickly, this is their, their big room. You can quickly see all the planning and the interesting that in the, TAC time zones are, each one of those colored area is one trade in that zone per one week's worth of work. That's the key to it. one trade, one zone, one week of work, pass it on to the next trade. So this, this um, project was delivered just like a symphony orchestra. And the reason I included the Moose Jaw Hospital, if you go back to the value added slide at the very beginning, uh, where we had 10% of the effort went into creating value on a lean project, they actually tracked this and they got up to 41%. And they did it by analyzing where they wasted time, going to the bathroom, um, not having tools ready. This week, they decided to work in, on co-locating power tools and ladders. There's 3% or locating power tools and ladders. 3% of, of the waste was, was going to that. And locating materials and waiting for instructions for materials. So they decided those pieces of the pie, that's what they were gonna work on this week that we happened to be there. So I don't have time to talk about this project. We went and toured it um, other than that their success is you know i do need to talk about it if a company like selling adopts lean for all of their projects they get to build all of the amazon towers of 43 stories they're negotiated work they hand them work once they've done one tower here you did such a great job with it for us using lean project delivery that we're going to give you the next tower and get can when can you go to work so this was their job site. It was just an amazing amount of work. There's Ron, my partner. We're, we're, they hadn't even talked this building off yet. And the basement or the main first floor suites were already that you needed to wear booties to go in there other than the mechanical systems weren't turned on. So very successful company because they, they made the, the leap <laughs> to lean project delivery. With the right plan, the team will be successful. Lean project delivery is a proven framework to deliver wow projects. Um, we know it works. Here's some projects that uh, um, lean project, it's just not down in the States. These are projects that are all in Canada. Um, there's a, here's, here's the playbook book on, on how to do it. Um, so um, if you're ready to make this jump, um, one of the, your options might be that you want to get certified in Lean Project Delivery. We're just releasing this program right now at Shift to Lean. And so what it involves is you register for the Take the Fast Lane workshop off of our website. That workshop includes all the system guides and, and a playbook on how to deliver wild projects. Um, the certification process involves writing exams, and you need to document your experience in delivering using lean practices on your projects. And then you can apply for three levels of certification. So this is just, um, we're I'd say about a week away from being able to take registrations for this um, lean project delivery project. So that's a, my, my commercial for, <laughs> that I, I talked to Kevin about if, if it's okay if here, here we got all this, these ideas of how to do a lean project. Well, how do I learn how to do it? Well, here's an option for you. 
So make the jump to laboratory project success. Thank you. If there's any questions, I'd be pleased to answer them. Do we have anybody there? Murray, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, sorry. I was just wondering if there's any barriers to adoption. Yeah, and I kind of spoke about that. Um, you know, that's the big, that's the best question because uh, I, I actually wrote an article. Um, there, there are no barriers to adoption. I think we perceive that we need to tender, but at the U of, U of W, it was provincial money, federal money. We having a spreadsheet that analyzes um, whether the the capabilities of a person, what their open book profit margins need to be. You don't have a, a tendered price. I think we have it. I think the barriers in our head. I believe that a, a hand pick picking a hand pick team with a on based on qualifications and the amount of money that they need to make by a, 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 a percent markup is a competitive process because we interview people we make it we check them out and so i think the barrier the biggest barriers are in our head and, and and i guess another barrier would be to have enough confidence to be able to make such a big change in the way we deliver projects so you know Fair th enough. Th that's what comes to mind Fair enough. Um, oh, and then on that same note, you know, the thing that made it sure it okay for Sherman was knowing that if we, we get this team together, we have a design assist fee, that if the envelope doesn't match our budget and what we've been talking about in our biweekly work sessions, and, and you know, we always, it's open book design all the way along what things cost. If all of a sudden that number doesn't make sense, we, we're free to go tender and pay that trade the design assist fee. And you know what? In all 10 plus projects, never had to do that. Hmm. So that leads me to a question uh, in terms of in this sort of delivery, who guides or leads the process? It, you know, because you've talked about the principles and the some of the benefits, but one of the questions in my mind is who who actually leads the process? You, you, you know, the, the guy that um, Bill Sharp, Manshield Construction, led the process at for target value delivery. Uh, you know, I showed him the way, right. but he led the process because he was a facilitator of all the sub trades. And, and this was specifically at the University of Winnipeg. Yeah, construction okay. manager. So in that and, case, and if, and if he, if you don't have a construction manager that has the kit, that the team management skills, well, then they would bring in a facilitator to train them on the systems, but they still end up owning that, um, that process. It right. needs to be the construction manager. And then the other part is the owner's got to be totally engaged. The design team, there's. There's no working in silos. So. Okay, fair enough. And so does that mean that most of these projects that you've presented uh, in your slideshow are mostly CM projects, not design build? That's true. Okay. Mostly CM, yeah. Mostly CM, okay. Um, yeah. so you, you know what you could, the other thing is like a lot of times lean can be brought in to fix a project like the first one at, at um, the forestry center. So you can you can flip any project at any time, to even on a, a, a CCDC too. Mm -hmm. You could just get the team in the room and say, "We're not going to have a project if we don't fix this." And you can do magic by just getting that team in a room and looking everybody in the eye and say, "Do we want to do this project or not?" You know. So that's helpful. Yeah. Thanks. Um, 
leads me to another question we have from the group is have uh, you been involved in specifically provincially or federally funded projects? I think you had mentioned that some of those projects were provincially or federally funded, at least in part. Yes. Um, the, uh, the Collaborative Science Research Center, University of Saskatchewan, federal and provincial money in there. Um, Richardson College for the Environment, federal and provincial money in there. So, okay. Yeah. Um, and the CSRB project at the University of Saskatchewan, am I right that that's, uh, that was with uh, a joint uh, design team, uh, including FLAD architects from the US? FLAD architects were in there with, uh, I know them as Frigstad, Fullstad, but I think they changed their name, were the, the local architect, and FLAD was the, the lab design group. Yeah. Great. The only reason I bring that up is that Rachel Nealon from uh, FLAD has presented that project uh, at one of our recent conferences for SL Can. So people yeah. on the line may have recalled that presentation. Um, I had one more question about lean commissioning because you, you have made the case for performance testing and commissioning uh, throughout the construction process. And, you know, I've been involved in several projects where that's been the goal and, and of course, the challenge. Some of it, uh, some of the challenges that I've seen uh, uh, on some of the projects I've been involved in is there's a resistance to a CX during construction by some members of the team uh, on occasion because of this uh, perception, perhaps incorrect, that you need to have a fully um, initialized series of systems and perhaps a completed construction in order to properly commission. So, uh, how do you, how have you uh, seen project teams overcome that perception? Um, boy, I, so y y that's a good question because a lot of times I've been project manager or owner's rep and I've had enough influence because I knew myself that coming out of the controls industry, I used to commission my own stuff. And so um, that's why I've been able to get, I, I never do projects without commissioning. So for me, I just assume it, it gets integrated into the project. Mm -hmm. And you know, you get the, you get the owner's operations people in there that they, they, once they do commissioning, they'll never go back. And, 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 and a, a good strong owner, team will get their own staff involved in the design commissioning process. Yeah. So there's just huge value. Um, so I don't know if that answered your question. No, it sounds to me, it sounds to me like the, the, what you've been advocating for is in terms of uh, integrated big room collaboration would bring people to the table to help challenge misconceptions around that. Right. And in terms of, yeah, you. I just want to yeah, and you definitely want to have hire that commissioning person at the front end of the project to have them in the big room because they're the guys that solve a lot of the risk associated with having to have contingency in especially in a lab building because it's all the interface problems like let's go back to the okanagan college project gary spent eight months because they have to prove out that they've got net and zero energy in the building and they didn't have measurement and verification of all their meters well thought out. And so they were adding meters and they had no clue at how to pull all that data together into a dashboard. Well, you ask those questions up front in the design process with the commissioning guy and the controls guy and you figure that all out ahead of time. Fair enough. Um, I think that that's why would you not? I guess the question becomes to you then: Why would you ever not want to have the expertise of the controls and the commissioning guy together to help you solve those risk problems? Right, you, and, and right. I think that that seems to be something that across the board, most sustainability consultants and and projects targeting lead, for instance, always advocate for uh, the commissioning consultant or the commissioning advisor to be involved at the very, very beginning of pre-design. So I think that th that's, that message has been well received. Um, there's one more question though, Murray, just in terms of handpicking the team. There's a note here saying, handpicking the team sounds like soul sourcing. And it, you know, the question is, is this not a barrier for publicly funded projects where 
the 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 party um, procuring the project, um, be it provincial or federal, uh, has to have competitive bidding. So, how do you uh, how have you seen projects that are funded um, from the government? overcome uh, or be able to, let's call it, uh, have a more active role in hand-picking the team? Yeah, so you have, you actually have a, a team uh, that, uh, uh, that of whoever you've got on your project already, the construction manager, the owner, the operations people, the architect, the uh, engineers, if you have them already, and you issue a, 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 I call it, it's an A3, it's 11 by 17, a request for qualifications or request for proposal. And you, you have that team interview three or four people that are firms, mechanical or the controls people, and you have a rating system that, you know, how are they with playing on a team? What's their technical capabilities? And you, you basically interview and everybody, the seven team, the selection team, rates the teams, you end up having a score for each of the proponents, a meeting after and decide who is going to be the best fit and has the qualifications. And, you know, finally you sort of say, well, are, are, is it a fair price? They're probably going to save more than their fee anyways, but, you know, do they have a fair price? And so it is a competitive team-based selection process that, um, you know, if that person wants to uh, see an A3 of how we do that, get them to send me an email and uh, it is a very competitive process excellent no that's that's helpful because i think that that's um one of the major barriers to that uh and it sounds like you've got the answer yeah, exactly. how to do it. i i got to know the auditors very well because they came to all the 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 selection process because just of the perceived perception that we might be just given bob's uncle the job Right. Well, no, we couldn't do that. It had provincial federal money in it. We had to have a fair decision process. So. Fair enough. Thank you, Murray. That's that's all the questions that we have for, for now. But I just want to say thank you for for taking us uh, down this uh, you know this this presentation and explaining um, to the, the the membership um, the the lean process for project delivery. It's a it's a topic that we haven't had. Uh, any webinars uh, on, to my knowledge, to date, and I think it's it, you're, you're, you've described uh, some tangible benefits and some specific examples where it, you know the the process can help us achieve uh, in, incredible results in, in terms of delivering sustainable science. So I just want to thank you for the presentation and for those people who are on the line and have additional questions for Murray. His email address is. Uh, right on the screen. So, Murray, thanks again. Really appreciate you uh, presenting to us today. Okay, thanks very much for having me, and good luck on all of your projects. Excellent. Thank you. Bye for now. Bye.